talk about. Hub. She's quite poor. Hello and welcome, my name is Ian, this channel is all about music and art and this is where we talk about music and art and in this video I'm going to look back at what's happening regarding music streaming in the UK uh, and over the last couple of months the UK government's Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee have been looking into the way that streaming platforms and large record companies manage payments to songwriters, musicians and performers. And on the 15th of October 2020, Parliament published a news article stating that this particular committee would inquire into the impact of streaming on the future of the music industry. The article stated that the inquiry will consider whether the government should take action to protect the industry from piracy in the wake of steps taken by the EU on copyright and intellectual property rights. I knew that some high profile musicians were giving evidence to this committee and the first of these meetings was on the 24th of November and uh, another meeting on the 8th of December. Now these meetings were long, lasting over three hours each. So what I've done is, is I've edited them down into shorter videos and I have put direct links to the questions in the description down below, which will make it easier for you if you want to look at a specific question and not watch the whole thing. It's worth providing a background to the witnesses giving evidence. So in the first session from December the 4th, we have Maria Forte, who is the managing director at Maria Forte Music Services. Maria has worked in the music industry for the last three decades. She began at Virgin Music Publishers and in the late 70s in an administrative capacity where she remained for 14 years. The last five years of that period as general manager until the sale of Virgin to the EMI group. She worked with many contemporary bands, writers including The Police, Human League, Culture Club, Soul to Soul, Clash, Stereophonics. Thereafter, she spent four years at EMI Music Publishing running the copyright department, as well as establishing the sampling department. She continues to work with Virgin Music Catalogue, as well as a rich and varied catalogue belonging to EMI. In July 2006, she created Maria Forte Music Services. Her clients include Warner Chapel Music, for the implementation of their Pan-European Digital Rights Initiative and she's worked with a number of artists and is currently working with Radiohead through her Warner Chapel Consultancy. Kawami Kwatan is a manager, record producer and owner of Ferocious Talent which he started in 2014. He works with new acts like Sarah Walk, Blue Lab Beats and Caitlin Scarlett. He also acts as international consultant and and manages and advises international acts, brands, actors and actresses on the music business in Europe. And Jose Luis Silvano is Director General at AIE, which is a management organisation for music performers and musicians, located in Spain and has headquarters in Madrid, Barcelona and Seville, and works on the provision of the law on intellectual property. AIE manages the intellectual property rights for its music performers. All of the sessions were chaired by Julian Knight and the complete list of committee members and the relevant links are in the description down below. Now this recording is made in agreement with the UK Parliament Terms and Conditions which state that I cannot alter the video or the audio of the recording in any way. I can't use this material for satire or use it on websites or social media platforms that promote, encourage and facilitate illegal activity and encourage hatred and antisocial behaviour. So here is part four of session one into the economics of music streaming. Uh, Damien Green. Um, I was about to ask Carl a question, but he's got to go and um, answer the door. Um, <laughs> but well, again, I'll, I'll pick this up with, with Maria then, because I, I wanted to follow up something Kwame said earlier on, where he said that you know, we're spending um, this inquiry thinking about the distribution of the money available and how little of it actually gets to artists and songwriters. Um, and that if if the liberals don't sort this out, then Kwame said tech would take over, which gives rise to the thought: Why haven't we already? Why you know why don't Apple, Amazon, Google, you know, money no object? They they could run hit driven industries because they can afford it. Why don't they just approach the artist direct? 
and disintermediate just take out you know even these giant big record labels so we'll uh-huh. have a go at that Artists are signed to labels. I mean, it, you would you would have to re-engineer the whole wheel, basically, because you would then be signing artists directly yourself. Or I suppose you could have artists delivering uh, songs to you, but you'd still have to have a contract. And do Apple want to do that? No, they want to sell products. You know, they're not even the only reason they're in music of streaming or, or no downloads anymore is to sell more of their 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 tech products. So I, I you know, they could, but then they, I, I just don't think that's a business that they want to be in. Well, okay, I'll, I'll put the question to, to, to Kwame again, since it was originally meant to. I was, I was picking up something you said earlier about how if, if, if you don't sort out this issue, the tech will take over. And, and I suppose, well, specifically you as a manager, have you ever thought, OK, I could, I could cut out all these labels I have to deal with? You know, why don't I go direct to the big tech boys and say, you know, why, why don't you basically set up your label or buy one of the labels or something like that and then cut out a whole raft of middlemen? Uh, who are who are taking money out of the system? Have you ever thought of doing that? Um, I I have artists, as I said, my 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 main core business before managerially with artists was with major le- record labels. I I have one artist now with a major record label, and the rest of my roster self releases. Some self release because they're not ready yet. Others self-release because actually they prefer it as a way forward. So what you're talking about, I'm, I'm already involved in and already have success on my wall as a result of it. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in that system. Um, yeah. And, and what makes you decide to, to walk away from contract negotiations with a label and say it's more beneficial to, to go independent? I mean, is, is it just money? Um, hold on one second. Can you just ask that one again? So I was saying, what, what what's the decision for you about whether you you say to an artist or you, you get an artist with a with a made label or whether you 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 self as you put it? Um, is it is it just money or are there other factors? No, no. Major label is because you've got to me a major label act. Okay, if you've got an act that is definitely suited towards a major label, then yeah, to me, I think, yeah, correct. Um, One thing I want to go back on that Julie asked me earlier about managers. Uh, uh, She was saying, you know, have you uh, had the government, you know, have you earned from, has the government supported you? And I wanted to just tie this into what you're saying here. A lot of managers have suffered it hugely, obviously, because live music has been completely hit on the head um, uh, and is suffering hugely. And, and this is, this is uh, I can't even express. I, 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 sure, my earnings have been affected by that. Um, I was a little distracted because people were banging on the window. So I just wanted to get that out. Now, Damien, I want to go back to your point. Um, give me a question one more time and I'll finish it off. It was um, it, what you say that you um, you put some acts on on levels and some acts self release. What you know, what makes the decision for you? What makes the decision is the artist. Some artists, I look at my friend manages Dua Lipa. Dua Lipa to me is a major artist, right? Um, I have some acts that I think are major label. I, I manage Blue Lab Beats. Blue Lab Beats are just signed to Blue Note Records. Blue Note Records, to me, seems to be the right label for Blue Lab Beats, okay? They're, you know, they're ready now. But they're ready because they've done two albums before and three EPs on independence. Do you know do you see what I mean? So they've had their time. What would have happened perhaps in the 1960s where people would have gone, done the whole touring circuit, toured. We have to remember the Beatles didn't just emerge. They did seven years, as we know, Hamburg, blah, this, that, X, Y, Z, and then they were ready. So to me, sometimes it's a matter of being ready for a major record label. And some artists just aren't ready for a major record label deal. And and the ones that come to me and say, I am and I really want, and I recognize that they aren't, they aren't. I'll often, and I've done that this year, 
just say, do you know what? I'm the wrong manager for you. Okay. Um, Maria. Also, yeah. I was going to say, that, um, you know, major labels are very good at doing what they do, which is they have a, 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 a big kind of a system. They, you know, they, the expenditure on a major label artist is enormous um, because, you know, they are, there's videos that have to be made. There's, you know, they, they organize the kind of press, the promotions, the marketing. It's a big vehicle surrounding Dua Lipa. You know, look at her videos, look at, you know, uh, arranging all, you know, interviews, getting her to the right people. It's expensive. And so, you know, if you, ha- I mean, if you have a major label artist, then, you know, it's, or somebody who, who like her, you know, who it was evident right from the start of her career that, you know, she was a star and and has to have a vehicle that is going to basically take her through the through the business and sell her. And and also just to to back up on that, sure, look, major label deals, your percentages will be lower. But then at the same time, the way that you look at it as a manager is your percentage will be lower and the percentage coming to you and your artist will be lower. But the the amount they then put into you, um, that's if it works. You have to remember that. If it works, the amount that they put into you, um, it, it will almost sort of teletransport you to a, a kind of a new level. And that new level has many other ways of earning. You know, you have brand deals. You know, you have, you have as I say, there's sponsorships, there's et cetera, which... Some major labels try and, you know, get a piece of, and others these days actually say, no, that's that's yours, yours to deal with. So there, I mean, are, there are different ways of earning now. Th- th- oh. Thank you. Thank you for that, that response. Uh, John Nicholson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. And as, uh, as we all know, this session is being live streamed. So I'd like to read out uh, something that uh, Colin Smith who is a musician watching the, the streaming has said, he said, I hope that you members of the panel can assist bringing an end to the scandal of streaming or there won't be any musicians left out with major artists. So that's a musician watching us and appealing to us for help. Um, Jose, uh, Luis, could I ask you very simply, we've run, we're running out of time. If there's a single lesson that we can learn from the Spanish model what is it? Well, I think the single message that we can find in the Spanish model is that uh, finally the, the performers, they have their own voice. They can uh, negotiate on, on their own uh, for their own rights. And finally, they can receive uh, fair compensation. Not only the future future performers, but non future. John Smith, that is a good friend of us, uh, he's, he's right. All the performers, or most of the performers, are receiving nothing. Then the, the lesson, the lesson that you can learn th- from Spain is that uh, remuneration right is successfully in place since 2006 in, the, in our law. Um, the remuneration right is arriving the performers is recognized legally and practically supported by directives. Oh, yes, you were close to that, and also. One part that is important, and they, they were saying and before, is that uh, the directive and, and the, the law that we have in, in most of the European countries is that about transparency. The lack of transparency in the distribution of revenues from the labels to the performers is a huge. Nobody knows what is what money, why, why this month I receive this money, next month I receive half or double, and this is something that we, oh, you, a slowmaker, sorry, should should also f- uh, fix uh, about that. Okay, the, that's an excellent point. So you. can I pick up that point, uh, please, with Maria? Now, you've talked about uh, metadata, and many streaming services have dashboards for artists. Should streaming services have a legal obligation to make it clear to artists and composers on these dashboards exactly how much they're owed addressing uh, Jose Luis's point that there's no transparency and people actually have no idea how much money they're due. 
well, that would be lovely, but but the relationship is it's a contractual relationship between first of all the artist to the label and then the label to the streaming service. So I don't think legally that would be possible, but what could well, we we've got the power to make recommendations as parliamentarians, whatever recommendations we want, we make law. So I mean, you know, a way around it would be to give to give people, a, you know, a grouping. So you would instead of actually because, you know, each of these agreements are under NDAs and they're strict NDAs, which is part of the issue of transparency. But, um, you know, you could have uh, with with artist um, dashboards, you could have groups of income. You know, you have earned this much this period. But remember the way it works and. You know that the fact that that the that the income that is divided up on a monthly basis is by the number of streams that have happened against the income earned in that month. So some months you could have more streams, some months you could have less streams. This is where user centric, I think, is 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 something that really needs to be considered because I think, I think all I think all of us have heard that message loud and clear in the course of these hearings. Let me finish by just asking uh, all of you to answer the same question. It's a question I ask on a regular basis here on the committee. Um, I've asked all our experts if they think their industry will benefit from Brexit, but not one single expert so far say th- think there's any benefit from Brexit. So can I ask each of you, Brexit, good for the industry or bad for the industry? Maria. Well, I think with no deal in place, very bad. With a deal in place, who knows? Because we don't, the main thing that's going to happen is the effect on the live music industry and tours. And, you know, for many English artists, that is a huge amount of their income and, okay. and a methodology to actually access different marketplaces. When it okay. comes uh, to. So for, 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 uh, just point out for Scottish, uh, Welsh, and Northern Irish artists. Sorry, as well. yes. Can I ask yes. you the same question? Nash, uh, please. Yes. Brexit, good, Brexit, good for the industry or bad for the industry? I, I, I can't see it being good. I, I, we have no deal at the moment, so I, I can only say bad. I, I go, COVID has already affected venues, performers, artists, agents, festivals, writers, uh, management, and I'm... And I'm now on top of this as well. And it's a further, it's a further hit. Uh, Jose Luis, yeah. Brexit, good or bad? Yeah, it's difficult to say from Europe. We are very, very, very sad that you are out of uh, the, the European Union. But uh, I, I have to say technically that, uh, well, some rights you know, for performers may be, may be in risk uh, because you are not uh, uh, part of the European Union. But um, this is the only thing that I can say. Okay. Thank you all for your brevity. Back to you, Chair. Full house for you uh, in terms of Brexit being bad. On that, on that bombshell, we're going to conclude the, uh, the first panel. I want to say thank you very much indeed to Maria, Kwame and Jose. We're going to take a short adjournment now for uh, two or three minutes as we set up our second panel. Order, order. So thanks very much for watching. In the next video, we will start to cover session two. The witnesses in that meeting are Fiona Bevan, who is a singer-songwriter, Soweto Kinch, the jazz alto saxophonist and rapper, and Niles Rogers from Chic, who is a songwriter, producer, and artist. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time. Bye.